Hey guys, it's Kaylee and welcome back to Hippie in a Suit where every week I talk about sustainability because I dream of a world where every young person can contribute to the climate movement. Today is a special video because it ties really closely to a project I have been working on at my job for the last year that actually launched this weekend. Youth Climate Action is a new online platform that provides young people with the information they need to meaningfully participate in climate negotiations because it can be actually really tough to even know where to begin when you first enter the space. The platform is a collaboration between Youngo, which is the official youth constituency for the climate negotiations, Climates, which is a youth organization and network for climate action, and the International Institute for Sustainable Development, which is a global think tank dedicated to sustainability issues. We launched the platform on June 5th, which is World Environment Day every year, and I will link the platform below so you can go check it out if you're interested in being part of the climate negotiations and don't know where to start. This video is another one in my series where I look at how COVID-19 is affecting different dimensions of sustainability, and today I'm going to be looking at the relationship between COVID and climate change. This is one of the topics we detail on the Youth Climate Action platform, so you can check it out there, or as always, I do create a blog post with links to my research, resources where you can learn more, or one or two organizations you may choose to follow or support if this topic is of interest to you. You can find the link to that in the description box below. My final piece of housekeeping before I dive in is I want to give a huge shout out to Hita, Marie-Claire, Ines, Sarah, Silke, Lorena, and Matt, who all contributed to the Youth Climate Action Platform and reviewed and contributed to my research on this topic for this video as well. So with that, let's get going. The links between climate and COVID are two-way, meaning that climate change has an effect on pandemics and diseases, and that this particular pandemic will have an impact on combating climate change. Let's start by looking at where COVID comes from and how climate change contributes to that. COVID is what is referred to as a zoonotic disease, which means that it most likely jumped from animals to people. These jumps are referred to as spillovers, and according to World Wildlife Foundation, spillovers are increasingly common with examples such as Ebola, SARS, MERS, and Zika all emerging due to spillovers in the last century. This is because humans are putting more and more pressure on nature, increasing the likelihood that these transmissions will happen from animals to people. While this is not exactly climate related and more to do with overall biodiversity loss, these two issues stem from the same overarching problem, which is of course the fact that we are wreaking havoc on our natural world. When we cut down forests for agriculture or livestock, this decreases the habitats of animals and makes it more likely that there will be interactions between humans and disease carrying animals. In addition, the illegal wildlife trade remains very popular and many of the animals traded in this domain are known to be disease carrying. While the main causes of spillovers are biodiversity loss and the illegal wildlife trade, climate change also plays a role. Research from the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa found that climate change is creating better conditions for organisms that carry diseases, such as parasites and microbes, which you may hear referred to as disease vectors, to transmit those diseases into other organisms. The warmer temperatures caused by climate change create the opportunity for these vectors to live longer or to live in places where they weren't previously found, which in turn increases the threat of transmission overall. Researchers are also concerned about what rising sea levels might mean for diseases. It's believed that there are ancient diseases frozen in ice that we as humans have not encountered for thousands of years and that could be released and reactivated as temperatures warm. In addition, floods could make waterborne zoonotic diseases more likely to interact with humans as well. So this summarizes how climate change could potentially contribute to disease and pandemics. Now let's move into the effects we are seeing COVID have on climate change. 
First is the emissions reduction we experienced as a result of the lockdowns. You may have heard it in the news that the global lockdowns last year led to massive reductions in greenhouse gas emissions as well as reduction of pollution. Many of us saw those photos of monuments that had been hidden by smog in highly populated cities for years and were finally visible. In April 2020, at the heart of the largest lockdown, daily emission levels fell by 17% compared to the levels seen in 2019. However, that massive drop was not sustained, and in total for 2020, the reduction was more like 7 to 8% overall. Some industries, of course, were more greatly affected, like aviation, which decreased emissions by an estimated 75% at the peak of the lockdown and 40% total over the course of the year. But it is worth noting that aviation is actually a relatively small source of emissions globally, only approximately 2% total. For me, I think the drops we saw point to a worrying reality of our current system. The scale of economic activity that ceased was massive. We were all locked in our homes, but the emissions were actually relatively small in the grand scheme of things. This really goes to show that our CO2 emissions are baked into many aspects of our lives, and reducing them substantially will take nothing short of a complete rethink of our systems. We must also be cautious about how we go back to our normal life. Now that vaccines are rolling out in some countries, there is discussion of a semblance of normalcy, which we all so desperately want, and perhaps even a roaring 20s comeback once there is a large-scale rollout of the vaccine. During the 2008 financial crisis, there was a noticeable emissions drop, but this was followed by a 6% increase in the recovery period. Because the lockdowns were forced changes to human behavior and not structural changes to our systems and the way we operate them, it is assumed that we will bounce back and there is concern that when we bounce back, we will be even more emissions intensive than before the pandemic. Another important point I want to make about the overall climate impact of the emissions reduction is that it did not actually have an overall effect on the levels of CO2 in our atmosphere. It only slowed the amount of CO2 that accumulated in the atmosphere last year. The carbon brief estimated that CO2 levels will rise by 2.48 parts per million, which is only 11% less than what was expected pre-COVID. So in other words, even though we dropped emissions, what's in the atmosphere didn't drop, it was just less than we expected to add. Only when those emissions drop close to net zero will we have our natural systems kick in and begin to uptake carbon and start reducing the overall levels in our atmosphere. So now let's move to the second effect of the pandemic on climate change with a potential longer term impact. And this is of course the effects of the massive stimulus spending on climate change. Many are touting COVID as the chance to completely rethink everything and build back better. Many, including myself, are hopeful we can use this crisis as an opportunity to make some really needed changes. And while this build back better mantra is nice in theory, it only works if policy and financial resources are there to back it up. Governments pumped and continue to pump massive amounts of money into our economies to keep them afloat but it has been a very mixed bag in terms of where that money is actually going. The Green Stimulus Index estimates only 3.7 trillion of the total 12.7 trillion in relief was spent directly in industries that will have a positive impact on climate and nature, and that the stimulus to date will have a net negative impact in 16 of the G20 countries. The story is very similar for the energy industry. The energy policy tracker found that G20 countries have committed almost double the amount of money to fossil fuels than they have to clean energy. The investments that we make at this very critical juncture, particularly in infrastructure and longer term projects, will have implications for combating climate change for decades to come. It is an extremely rare opportunity to pump so much money into the economy, and therefore we need to look closely at where it's going and the future that it's helping us to build. 
And finally, there will be an impact on international cooperation about climate change due to COVID-19. As I discussed in my video about the U.S. re-entering the Paris Climate Agreement, which you can watch up here if you're interested, 2020 was meant to be a huge year for increasing ambition on the agreement. In 2020, countries were meant to submit their updated and more ambitious nationally determined contributions, which are essentially their commitments to reduce emissions. COP26 in Glasgow has been seen as a very important moment for the international community to reinforce their commitment to climate action. And it was also expected that there were going to be a whole bunch of important rules around the agreement made, such as carbon markets, loss and damage, and climate finance. These were all meant to be agreed at that meeting. Unfortunately, the pandemic made it completely impossible for negotiations to gather, and the COP26 was moved ahead a year to November 2021. There is a concern that such a delay will be detrimental to the process because there are already countries looking for excuses not to act. And any consideration for virtual negotiations and meeting is really difficult because developing countries feel, and I think rightfully so, that their voices are not adequately heard in virtual online formats. They can't grab people in the hall and ask them for things and hold each other accountable. Being in person for these types of really big stakes negotiations are extremely important. At the moment, the planning for COP26 in November is still moving ahead, but the situation does remain fragile in many countries and it is to be seen if negotiators will actually be able to gather. Another interesting question around these negotiations is what the pandemic will mean for climate finance. Countries have had to spend massive amounts of money to keep their own economies afloat. And when this is all said and done, will there still be money for the Green Climate Fund, which is already underfunded? And perhaps the largest question of all, did this pandemic crush the faith we had for globalism and what does it mean for multilateralism going forward? Did COVID reinforce the fact that we need each other to respond to these big global issues? You know, there are no borders. We have to work as a global community. Or did it show that the multilateral system was completely ill-prepared for working together when a big crisis strikes? All of this is something we need to consider as we recover and move forward. All of our systems are interlinked and the way we respond to one crisis will have implications on how we respond to others. COVID and climate are no exceptions. Let's continue to hold our policymakers accountable so that we can address both of these massive issues and create a better tomorrow for everyone. And with that, I'm going to close for today. As always, thank you so much for being here. Don't forget to check out the blog post if you want more information and to continue learning about this topic. If you learned something in this video, give it a like, and don't forget to check out the Youth Climate Action Platform if you're interested in joining other young people around the world in advancing climate action. That's it for now. See you in the next one, and until then, keep fighting the good fight. Bye!